Okay. 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 So uh, next speaker is uh, Filippo De Maghi from uh, University of Genova. And uh, we'll talk about uh, unitarization of the radon transform. So, please, uh, so thanks a lot, Valeriano. Thanks to all of you for being patient and thanks for the invitation. So uh, it is, of course, to me, a very special occasion to celebrate Claudio's birthday. And uh, coming to the title of the conference, I don't know if I've ever had any thoughts in mathematics at all, but uh, if I did, well, there's very little intersection with either geometry or mathematical physics, and uh, certainly no interaction whatsoever, no intersection whatsoever with philosophy. Although I must say that I discovered, I recalled uh, during Marco's talk that my Bartocci's number is at least one, because I have a paper with Marco who has a paper with Claudio. So um, there is some, some connection, and jokes apart, there are several connections uh, even on the mathematical side. But if, if our interact intersection in mathematics has been much smaller than what I certainly hoped or perhaps even thought, uh, our, could, our intersection is li in life has been huge. And to the point that I really don't consider myself uh, and Claudio as friends, I don't consider Claudio my friend, I consider him family. And uh, in fact, that's why I took the liberty of posting some of the pictures that uh, show how uh, deeply rooted our relation is. And uh, I don't, you don't have to ask anybody to post your family's pictures, right? So I, and as you could uh, witness, I, I had, <laughs> problems with my internet so all I had to do was to cross the street and go to Claudio's which has been pretty much one thing that has happened all over these many years of friendship if you have a problem just cross the street and Claudio will be there and he's been there for with his uh, rock solid faithfulness for 20 over 20 years so when I had to choose a topic to uh, to speak about and of course, you all know that I, or at least those of you who know me know that I am an analyst. Uh, so um, I, I was in, in, in some kind of, a, of trouble, but then in the end, I decided to speak about one topic that has some geometric flavor, although perhaps the, 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 the word geometry to me has a, a much more naive uh, sense than what I have uh, learned over these two days. Which, which is what it means to you guys. So uh, what I will try to uh, explain something about is this uh, business about the Radon Transform that I've been busy for uh, some, some years now with, with other friends in, in Genoa and elsewhere. So uh, what is the, the deal here? Uh, the deal here is to understand something by taking averages of it of some kind. So uh, I will show you some videos taken from uh, Samuel Siltanen's uh, homepage. And here you see a, a rectangle and the area of the various sections that it has with several different parallel lines. And if you change the object and, same, and take something slightly more complicated, and then you play the same game, well, you see that the yellow uh, uh, graph, which is the mapping the, the, area of the, this, the area of the various intersections is a lot more complicated. And in fact, guessing the white from the yellow is not so easy. But, but the upshot of this, of this particular uh, video, this last one, was to show that, of course, the Adam Transform of Superman is actually Batman. And so in, in, this, uh, in this business, there, there's some space for uh, heroes or superheroes. And in, for analysts, the heroes are really L2 functions, as you will see. So um, much more seriously, what people are really interested in uh, are serious radon transform, which means that uh, what you get is a bunch of images of scans of uh, parts of the human body, typically skulls or, or other parts. And then what you really want to do is, is this, is to recover the shape of the unknown inside of what you have scanned by some kind of device. And typically, 
this device is just an application of a mathematical theorem, which is, of course, uh, the topic of Radon inversion. So, mathematically speaking, and uh, you will forgive my, my very naive attitude, a uh, Radon transform is just an integral of a function over a set of lines or hyperplanes or, as, you, as we will see, more general manifolds. So, uh, in its very basic form, the Radon transform of a function, say, defined on a plane, is a function that depends on, on two parameters. One is a unit vector, which selects the uh, direction uh, perpendicular to the, the line, and then a signed distance p. So the Radon transform of f at omega uh, comma p is the integral of f uh, along the line which is orthogonal to omega at distance p from the origin. And the same, of course, can be, can be spelled out for, for functions defined in, in Euclidean space, whatever the dimension is. So there is a, a point in, in the unit sphere selecting a direction, and then there is a real number selecting a distance from the origin. And of course, there is some parity because we, if you swap around the, the unit vector and also the, uh, the signed distance P, you get exactly the same hyperplane. So um, let's be a, a slightly more serious. And so uh, together with the Radon transform, there is a natural notion of a joint or a dual to the Radon transform, which is just simply taking the integral of a function, which is this time defined uh, on the set of hyperplanes, so a function capital F of two variables, and then you take all the hyperplanes passing through a given point, and that's the adjoint of the Radon transform. So it's a, it's a very dual geometric construction. So classically, in order to be able to, to invert the Radon transform, what one does is one appeals to the Ries potentials. These are uh, what uh, uh, in analysis are called um, Fourier multipliers. So that means that if you want to define what they do on an L2 function, you really, do, you really say what they do on, on its Fourier transform. So in this case, a Ries potential i uh, power alpha is just multiplication by modulus of the variable to the minus alpha. So with the help of these potentials, there is a classical inversion theorem, which is a somehow due to a fitz John, and it's, a, it's some version of the original uh, proof by, um, by Radon. And it says that for every alpha smaller than the dimension, there is an inversion formula, which goes as follows. You have on, on the right-hand side, you have your Radon transform, you applied some kind to, of Ries potential, then you apply the dual to the Radon transform, and then you apply another Ries potential, and you get back your function f. So uh, if you then pick a very special value of alpha, this value which is d minus one over two, then alpha and um, alpha and th those two exponents appearing up there in the inversion theorem actually end up coinciding. extended and it, will, it was extended by Helgeson to a much more elegant statement, which says that uh, if you consider the mapping which is obtained by composing the Radon transform with a specific kind of pseudo-differential operator, precisely that Ries potential of order minus alpha dot, then this composition extends to a unitary operator from L2 of Rd to L2 of the functions defined on the parameter space that are even, even because of what I uh, showed earlier. Now, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of result was pursued and uh, uh, set up by Helgeson in much greater generality. Now, in the case d equal 2 and d equal 3, these are the risk potentials that actually appear in the classical inversion formula. So, what Helgeson did, and uh, what my collaborators and I also tried to follow um, was some kind of a, a more general uh, uh, understanding of these issues. And um, so the uh, geometric duality that Helgeson was about uh, throughout most of his career was this, uh, this notion where you have a couple of spaces, and we will see what kind of spaces you have. One is X and one is Psi. X is the space, is the so-called input space, and it's the, the space where functions live, the, the space where your objects to be analyzed are defined. 
And then as you, as you see, there's a bunch of sub objects in, in X that are labeled by points in a, in a label space, psi. And of course, in the case of the classical radon transform, these are, this is the space of hyperplanes. So uh, suppose it, it, now I'm speaking very loosely, you have a family of subsets of X and all these uh, subsets are endowed with some kind of a measure. Uh, and then um, a radon transform of a function defined on X is the function on, on psi, which assigns to the point psi, which is a label of a subset of X, the integral of F along that subset of X, which has a particular measure. So this is a very general uh, notion of radon transform. And um, what Helgeson was really interested in was the situation in which uh, both X and psi are homogeneous spaces of the same group G. So um, the, this, uh, the setup is the following. Uh, you have a locally compact second countable topological group. So now I am using a mixture of what Helgeson has done for Lie groups and what my collaborators and I have generalized slightly to the case of more general topological groups. And so I'm using a combination of, of those two, of these two languages. So suppose then you have a group and you have two transitive G spaces and you def denote the actions of G on X and Psi with uh, two different notations. So one is X goes to G applied to X square brackets and the other one is G dot Psi. And so of course, because of um, of the transitive action. And once you have decided what the isotropy is, then of course, X and Psi become homogeneous spaces. And, uh, and so um, uh, what is this, the notion of dual pairs? Now, um, due to Cheren, uh, there is a, a natural notion of incidence that was uh, defined in 1942, uh, when you have two homogeneous spaces for the same group. And you'd say that um, the point the points X and Psi, which are points in, in the homogeneous spaces, so in the quotient spaces, are incident if the cosets as subsets of G intersect. This is the notion of incidence due to Chern. And so uh, Helgeson picked it, picked it up and, and was used it to define this notion of Psi hat and, and X check, which means that you if you fix a point psi in, 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 in the coset space, then you collect all the points in X such that X and psi are incident. So you have to think of X hat as the actual manifold labeled by psi. And the other way around, if you fix a X in, in the X space, and then you collect all the manifolds in psi, all the labels, for which uh, that go through X essentially. So those for which X and Psi are incident. This gives rise to this um, notion of, uh, of uh, duality, meaning that you call X, X and Psi a dual pair if the maps that assign to X, uh, X check and to Psi, Psi hat are both injective. And this gives rise uh, to the famous Helgeson's double vibration, which is that object over there which I'm sure that you guys from, from uh, geometry know very well how to interpret. Now, um, from the point of view of, of analysis, what really matters, of course, is the presence of some measures. So we, what we do is we want to deal with dual pairs with measures. So what is the, the story here? The story is that you start assuming that uh, in all of these objects, on all of these objects, there are some measures defined. And more precisely, you start assuming that the full spaces X and Psi do have uh, uh, good measures with respect to the action of G. Now, in the work of Helgeson, uh, they, uh, both X and Psi are assumed to have completely invariant, G invariant measures, DX and D Psi. We are happy with slightly more general situation where you have so-called relatively G invariant measures. This means that if you act with the group element G, on a function f and then you take the integral, uh, well, if we were on, the, on a group and that were, was the, the Haar measure, then the integral would not change. But in, in this situation, what changes is that the integral gets multiplied by a factor which only depends on, on the group element that you have used. 
And the same should happen both in X and Psi. So this is the presence of global measure on X and Psi. But this is not, of course, the end of the story. We want ways of, first of all, we want ways of understanding what the manifolds of interests are, and then we want to put measures on them. So we start by fixing a point X naught in the space X, and you start, we start by creating the first and reference manifold psi naught hat, which is simply the action of the group H, which is the isotropy on the, on the psi side, and you act with this H on X naught, and you get uh, some, some manifold. And this will be the, the basic and the ground manifold. Then you go on the other side, and you pick a Borel section. This means that you want to lift points from Xi to group elements. And in what way? Well, in such a way that the action of the group element that you pick, when acts on, on the label Xi naught, then gives you back Xi. So this is a classical Borel section. And so what do you do? You go back to the other side and you use this, this Borel section to define all the other manifolds. So if, you, if Xi is a label, you pick the group element sigma of Xi and you act with that on the ground manifold Xi not hat and you get a new manifold Xi hat. And so you have a bunch of manifolds. And what the measure theoretic assumption now is that there is a nice measure on psi naught hat, which is, has to be um, relatively invariant. So that means the same thing as, uh, as above. So it, it, it changes nicely with the action of the group. And then once you have a measure on psi naught hat, you can push it forward to all the other manifolds with, via the action of, of, of the group, which, which means via the selection of sigma. So in the end, what we have is what we call dual pairs with measures, which means that X and Psi have measures and each of the individual manifolds X Psi hat have measures. And so once this is the, the situation, then you have a, a sensible notion of Radon transform, which means that if you have a function on X, you can associate to it a function on Psi whereby the uh, value of the Radon transform f at point psi is just the integral of f over that particular manifold psi hat that has the measure that we have uh, constructed. So, um, so the main, uh, the main uh, geometric uh, situation is, is this. This, I, I don't have the time to, to give billions of examples, but in, in last uh, Helgeson's book, there are 17 completely different examples ranging in really very different contexts. And from, from Helgeson to our construction, the, these, construct, these examples increase in number also significantly. And uh, the, the other thing that we do is it has a different kind of flavor and it has to do with uh, more properly with uh, harmonic analysis. And it is an assumption on the so-called quasi-regular representations. So what are the assumptions that we make? Well, we start, of course, with the dual pairs with measures, and, and, uh, and then uh, we have measures on the full space X and Psi, and therefore we have L2 functions, both on L2 effect, on, on X and then Psi. And so there is a very natural, there are very natural uh, unitary representations on these uh, Lebesgue spaces, and these are just given by the action of the group on the elements on, on X and on Psi. And then there is a normalization alpha and, and beta, which simply makes these uh, operations unitary. So that's just uh, the Jacobian, just loosely speaking. So the assumption here is that these important, very important representations are irreducible. And, and, and then secondly, we assume that this is really a very much analytic, but uh, almost always satisfied assumption that uh, there are pi invariant, there is a, sub, uh, a subspace of L2 of X, which is invariant under all the operations given by the quasi-regular representation. So this is another way of saying A, you should think of A as a, quote, translation invariant subspace of L2. And you assume that on this translation invariant subspace, the Radon transform is well defined, and and that it admits a reasonable adjoint operator. 
And once you have uh, this general, very general setup, there is a first uh, uh, sort of um, reasonable theorem that says that uh, the Radon transform, which, which is originally defined on this uh, invariant subspace A, then admits a closure R bar, which is a densely defined operator, which, which has a very nice uh, almost commuting property uh, with respect to the two representations, pi and pi hat. You see, you have a Radon transform, R bar, which connects functions on X with functions on psi. And so you can act with the representations uh, pi and pi hat on the two sides, and, and the two actions almost commute up to a factor which is a combination of all the various characters that are involved in the game. So alpha and beta and gamma and the section sigma. And so furthermore, this R hat is the unique closed extension of R. So put it in a different way, uh, we can almost think, but we will see a, a precise statement that the Radon transform or its closure is almost a perfect intertwiner between two very important representations, pi and pi hat. And that's exactly what, where we want to go to in, in a more specific way. So the second theorem, which is the unitarization theorem, which, is, which was alluded to in the title, is in its general form is this one, which says there is a, a, a nice, uh, um, unique, uh, self-adjoint and positive operator I, which is defined on, on the xi side. So this has to be thought of as a generalization of the release potential, okay? So it's an operator on the label side with the property that is, technically this is called semi-invariance property. So which means that I and pi hat almost commute. Again, uh, the price to pay is the character chi of G. And uh, this operator has the property that the Ries potential had. If you compose the Radon transform with this operator I, then you get an operator which can be extended to a unitary operator from L2 of X to L2 of Psi. And this new operator Q perfectly intertwines pi and pi hat. So this is the basic and general unitarization theorem that I want to now to discuss in more concrete and geometric examples. And so um, let's see, uh, but, but before doing that, I want to show you that in this general setup that has indeed several concrete examples, uh, there is a, a, a very nice inversion theorem that comes up. And this is, going, this is done whenever you have one of these uh, uh, wonderful representations that analysts really like. And these are the so-called square integrable representations. Uh, and not every group uh, has square integrable representations and, uh, not, and they are not always very treatable. But uh, the, the notion of integrable representation appeals to what is called uh, the, the discrete series of, of G. And this means the following, that there exists a, a, what we call a analyzing vector or admissible vector. So an element psi in L2 of X with this uh, wonderful property, the, what we call the voice transform, which is this uh, coefficient of the representation, which is obtained in the following way. You have a vector F in, uh, in L2 of, uh, of, of X, and, and then you build a, a new uh, function on the group, which is obtained by taking the inner product of F with the representation acting on the fixed analyzing vector psi. Okay, this is called the voice transform for reasons that I, I might be able to explain later if anybody's interested in. So the assumption, so the representation is called square integrable. If this voice transform so mapping L2 of X into the group, into functions on the group, is actually an isometry into the L2 of the group. If this is the case, then there is this wonderful uh, reconstruction formula in the weak sense, which is, a, you know, a very general uh, version of a Euclidean type of reconstruction. What does that mean? That with the operators produced by that re representation, you get several directions, pi g of psi, in L2. And so what is inside the integral is just a 
projection of f in the direction of pi g of psi. So you should think of these as a bunch of independent, or actually not all of them are independent, but a bunch, several different directions inside L2, and you glue them up just the same way you reobtain a vector in R3, just summing up its projections along E1, E2, and E3. So this is what uh, square integrable representations do in the end. So the theorem, the inversion theorem, uh, says that if you if you have a square integrable representation and pick out a, a an admissible analyzing vector psi, then under some mild technical assumptions that are almost always satisfied, you can reconstruct f from the Radon transform. And because in the formula that you see down there, only to the right hand side, there's only the Radon transform of f. And now let me give an example which is uh, well, first of all, let me give a moral proof of, of this statement, and it's a, it's a two-line proof, so I think every exposition should contain a, a proof, and no proof should be longer than through three lines. So this is the voice transform of f, as I defined in the previous slide. So it's the coefficient of f in a product with pi g of psi. And since q is, a, is an isometry, I can plug in it at both sides. Now, Q is defined to be I times the Radon transform. But I is a self-adjoint operator. So I can move it to the other side, and then I can use the uh, property of I, which means that I can pull it on the other side of pi hat at the price of having a, this function chi sticking out. So what you have is from the yellow formula, that is the formula, the inversion formula given by the square integrable, integrability of the representation, the voice transform can be replaced by what is uh, uh, this new uh, formula involving just the Radon transform of F. So this formula provides a, an inversion formula that actually was implemented by people using the so-called shielded group. Now I'm. I don't have much time, and I want to go to. Uh, I want to go to more geometric considerations given the audience, and so let me just say that in, in for all practical purposes, uh, in, in applications, so using the so-called shearlets, and let me make a long story short. This inversion formula says that you can start from the Radon transform of a function, and then apply two very popular um, practical tools. One is a wavelet transform, and another one is the convolution with a scale-dependent filter, and then you come up with an object uh, who, which gives the so-called shearlet coefficients, and the shearlet coefficients are one of the most popular, really truly in applications, uh, devices in order to recover signals from, from some kind of transform, namely this, this famous shearlet transform. So in other words, our theorem is indeed applicable in one of the most concrete uh, tools that is uh, available on the net, namely shearlets. But from the geometric side, I, I think the, the, uh, is where what the interesting things happen. Now, let's go back to the origin. How, after all, Helgeson was a guy in, in symmetric space theory. So he, he developed all of his tools and theories and uh, group machinery to treat first of all, symmetric spaces, and then other related objects. And he had proved this uh, theorem in the most uh, uh, simple of all possible situations. So uh, his construction should work for symmetric spaces, right? So the point is, if you go through his immense literature, uh, well, you don't find a statement uh, of, of that precision. Uh, if we were to apply our machinery, and deduce the, uh, the unitarization of the Radon transform on, on, on symmetric spaces, then there is a big, big problem that the, um, unitary, the quasi regular representations uh, for symmetric spaces are not irreducible at all. So the tool the, that we have used just fail miserably. So one thing we wanted to do was to recover the result for symmetric spaces in some other way. So we did that, and I am personally sure, and uh, Sindaram Tangavelu told me that uh, I am right, 
Helgerson did know the, uh, this fact for symmetric spaces, and even Harish Chandra knew it. Just, uh, it is just impossible to locate a proof, a complete proof of the unitarization result in their huge um, uh, mass of, of uh, papers. But they knew about it. And I have no claim of originality, but uh, all I want to say is that we wanted to reconstruct a proof so we were fooling around with some technicalities with which I will not bother you. Uh, we did come up with a, an operator lambda, which is in that funny diagram uh, down there, which does the job. But what I want really to, to stress is the following thing, that the proof that we devised and which is up, which is there, it is essentially the proof that that very complicated diagram up there works where all these those arrows are commute and do blah 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 but the the main thing is that we devised a proof that um, counts on two basic ingredients one is that a differential operator i naught and the second one is a crucial key ingredient in the analysis over on symmetric spaces which is the very famous harris chandra c function so the fourier multiplier that works for symmetric spaces is that num is that multiplier w to minus one half over c lambda in modulus where w little w is the cardinality of the Vi group so that's the fourier multiplier so this proof i we were particularly happy with because what we wanted to do was not just uh, find a proof for the symmetric spaces because we were we were convinced that Helgerson knew it and Arish Chandra knew it and uh, everybody knew it, which is we didn't know it. Uh, but we wanted to find a proof that could be generalized to the situations and completely different situations that we were interested in. And this is the situation where we deal with discrete structures, so homogeneous trees. So I will spend the last 15 minutes or so of my talk illustrating what happens with these discrete structures. What are homogeneous trees? Well, this are, these are three pictures of the same homogeneous tree, or actually a portion of a homogeneous tree. A homogeneous tree is an undirected, connected, loop-free graph. This means that um, it is connected and there are no loops. And undirected means that the edges are just edges and they, there are no arrows. For, for the people I'm talking, to here now today, there's no quiver fooling around here. So uh, this picture that I, I took in El Escorial last June, this shows a picture of trees that are not trees. In fact, if you look carefully, these uh, trees that were um, um, worked on by very skilled gardeners form loops. There are loops. There's this wonderful garden where all these trees are connected to each other and the branches form loops. So these are not trees in the mathematical sense. But so trees, homogeneous trees, uh, are loop-free graphs that are Q-homogeneous, which means that each vertex has exactly the same number of adjacent vertices, so Q plus one. So the picture you, have, you see there is a portion of a two-homogeneous tree because every, every vertex has three adjacent vertices. So then one fixes an origin, and then uh, when one has a very natural distance on a homogeneous tree, which is the number of steps you have to take for, to go from one point to the next, and then there is a very natural group acting on a homogeneous tree, which is the group of isometries, and which is called out x. And then if you act with a stability with, with G on, on, the, on the tree, there is a stability group, which is a, a compact subgroup of out X. And so you have the natural realization of X as a homogeneous space. And then there is also a notion of a boundary of a tree, which, which is obtained by taking chains, infinite chains, and you identify chains that coincide uh, from some point onwards and then you identify them, so you define the equivalence class of all these chains, and this defines the notion of boundary, which turn out, turns out to be a compact space. And you can also identify the boundary as the set of infinite chains starting at, a, a, at the origin. And uh, the, the stability K does act on 
the boundary, which which and, and does so transitively, which actually shows, by the way, that the, the boundary is compact. And then it's, it's easy to find, to define nice measures on, on a nice k invariant measure on the boundary. And, and then uh, the re remark here is that you can actually play the same game uh, with any vertex v in place of, of the fixed origin. Now let's see, so now we have our space, our X is, is the tree, is the homogeneous space, is, is, is the input space. Now we want to define some manifolds there. And these will be the so-called horror cycles. And to define what horror cycles are, uh, let, me, let me go as follows. Uh, you, you, you take a, a, a similar, a different picture of a tree just by sort of um, suspending the tree from a point at infinity, from a point at the boundary omega. So locally, your, your tree looks like this. So if, if you do that and you take two points, V and W, in this portion of the tree, you start, uh, you connect V with W, which you can do in a unique way, and you put plus signs every time you go from V towards the uh, a point at infinity and you put a minus sign uh, every time you come back from the from infinity to w and you count them up you sum them up in the natural way so you put an index you give an index by counting the number of pluses minus the number of minuses and this gives you a notion of so-called horocyclic index which of course then depends on the point omega at infinity so now you have your horror cycles so horror cycles are the collections of points in, in, on the tree that have the same horror cyclic index. So in this picture here, uh, which is of course just a small portion of the tree, the horror cycles are the dashed lines. More precisely, are the vertices that lie on those dashed lines. And so horror cycles are parametrized by uh, two parameter, parameters. One is the point at infinity, omega, and the other one is the integer that selects the particular horror cycle. So the horror cyclic index, which is constant along that horror cycle. So the parameters are two, omega and an integer. So now the, what I want to say is that we can recast our geometric setup in the, in the, in the, in the situation of trees so we have something that looks pretty much like uh, the X space I was talking about earlier. And then um, we have a boundary, which I wanted to raise. I didn't have the time to do that. And then there is a notion of uh, horror cycles. To make a long story short, there is a G dual pair. So the tree and the set of its horror cycles form a G dual pair. And again, uh, we can then form a sensible and reasonable and interesting notion of Adam transform, which is the integral, so which in this case is just a summation, of a function defined on the tree along the horror cycles. And again, our big theorem on, on um, G-dual pairs doesn't work because, again, the natural representations on these spaces as it happened for symmetric spaces are not irreducible. So one has to use another trick. And so let me uh, go through the ingredients of the result. And the, and the result is proved uh, following essentially the same diagram that you follow for symmetric spaces. And in fact, the truth is that we went the other way around. We devised this way of proving a theorem for uh, trees and then we apply that to symmetric spaces. But the ingredients are these. There's this, this funny function, this delta function, that um, is just a power of the homogeneity, which will play the role of a um, um, uh, normaliz normalizing thing. And it's not too important at this stage. And then uh, there is a way uh, for every vertex v, but let's say the origin will do uh, for the time being, of identifying functions on the horocyclic space with functions of the two parameters that describe the horror cycles, namely points in the product omega times z or z. Then we have uh, nice functions of horror cycles that are Schwartz functions. 
So since omega is compact, as I said, the saying that a function decays very fast uh, is measured just by what happens on the on the integral on the integer parameter. So the requirement is that the modulus of the function decays faster than any power of 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 n. And 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 then there is a way of uh, devising the the crucial objects, which are functions f on the or cyclic space, which have two properties. The first of all, first of all, the, they decay fast when multiplied by that power of q. So delta one half times this function has to be a Schwartz function. So the requirement is just f has to decay fast enough. And then the second requirement is a symmetry requirement. And it, it says that when you integrate such a function along the boundary, which is compact, then you get a function which is a function of just the integral of the integer n. And you require that this is an even function. So um, then you, you define L2 flat uh, on the space of four cycles to be the space of L2 functions on horror cycles that satisfy the flatness property, the, the, the symmetry property flat. And then uh, two more ingredients enter the game. One will, uh, be able, will be the ingredient necessary to define the appropriate Fourier multiplier and is the famous Heischander C function discrete version. So uh, back in the 90s and 80s and 90s actually, there, there was a lot of work on, on, done on homogeneous trees and the Planchard formula, blah, blah, blah. And uh, everything was constructed by pretty much imitating what was done for symmetric spaces. And the correct Heisenstein C function was, is, turns out to be this one. And then there is a dual group that has to come into the picture because if we want to play the Fourier game, once we have one of the parameter space, which is Z, the integers, we have to have its dual group and the dual group must be a torus. Now, in this case, the torus is not just R mod Z, but is R uh, mod uh, a, a suitable expansion of Z. And, uh, and then there is that constant, constant playing some, some kind of a role. We are almost done. And so the unitarization theorem for in the discrete setup is the, is the following. There is a Fourier multiplier you see, it is this very complicated looking operator, but it's not really complicated at all. If you take a function which is, which is a function of the two parameters, one is omega and the other one is a, in the dual group of, of, of the integers. So is a, is a, is a torus. Um, now there was a mistake there. T is not in Z, it is in the torus. Then you, you, you define an operator by saying that on the, on the frequency side, you multiply by a constant divided by the Harish Chandra C function, exactly what happened in the symmetric space case. And then with the help of this operator J, which was defined spectrally in the line above, we can come up with an operator lambda from nice functions on, on Schwartz functions on L2 of psi, and but, but in, in that way, and the composition of lambda times R then extends to a unitary operator which maps unitarily L2 of X into the space of L2 functions on psi that are uh, symmetric. And this operator intertwines perfectly the, uh, the, irre the non-irreducible but very regular representations pi hat and pi. So this was just to, to show you that in some uh, harmonic analysis, there is some role played by geometric considerations and in particular I wanted to stress the fact that in this particular kind of analysis there is a very intriguing symmetry or uh, let's say duality between what happens for very important geometric spaces like symmetric spaces and emerging uh, discrete structures such as uh, uh, homogeneous trees. So uh, in fact, uh, symmetric spaces and leak groups were the, perhaps the only uh, mathematical field in which uh, Claudio and I met uh, at some uh, midpoint. So I thought it was a, a reasonable thing to do to, to tell him and all of you this, this uh, little bit of story. And, uh, 
my thanks to all of you for 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 your patience and for waiting for me to cross the, the street thank you thank you i want to go back to thank you filippo for your beautiful talk and uh, is there uh, anyone who wants to add some comment or ask some question filippo thank you for uh for the talk, it was perfectly geometric talk, I think, at least. Uh, and well, I have a, a very uh, well naive uh, curiosity, the typical of uh, a guy like me that knows nothing about the subject. Is there any classification of groups arising as uh, isomet uh, isometry groups of Q homogeneous trees? So you, you we know. It's, it's not i mean classification is i i don't think it's it's the right word there's a lot of work done on on out x for homogeneous uh, trees q and a lot of of uh, is known but uh, a lot of it is not known for example uh, the representation theory is known it was uh, completely worked out by olshansky in the 80s but and the representations of these groups uh, divided up into three categories, uh, the so-called uh, special representations, and then there is um, the spherical representation, and then there are these cospidal representations that are seem to be incredibly important. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, there is no reasonable realization of cospidal representations. And in fact, that's what I am doing in my life now, trying to understand what is... <laughs> What is the reasonable space of functions for defining these representations in a tractable way? And uh, um, it's ongoing research. So there is no classification. You, I mean, it's difficult to, to say if, is, if a certain given group arises. I think it is. I think it is difficult. They enjoy many properties of the semi-simple Lie groups, and they have variations of decompositions such as the Ivazava decompositions, but are not exactly the same. They, they are variations, integral ways of defining uh, decompositions. Uh, I yes. wanted to ask a question to Marco, but since, <laughs> yeah. since I skipped yeah. the second half of his talk, maybe it's too late. Yeah. You talked about total lattices. Uh, and so the question is obvious. Uh, you and I worked on photoflows flows a, a, a few billion years ago when, when uh, um, uh, dinosaurs were still around. But uh, is, is, there, is there any relation to, to that? I don't know a good point. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Thanks to this conference, uh, I, th this, this question came to my mind, but I didn't have time to... <laughs> Okay. To, to check. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I have a question for you, um, Filippo. I liked very yes. much your talk and I have just a curiosity about the name voice transform. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the origin seems to be the following. Okay, when, when you have a, a representation, you built that function, that funny function, right? So um, the idea, uh, the question is that um, in many practical situations, you really have access to this transform and you want to recover the function. So the analogy is the following. Suppose you have a, you can hear a voice and you want to understand, so a sound, and you want to understand who is the person. Or, or say you, have, you hear a kind of instrument and you want to be able to say this is a violin or this is a piano. And the frequency plot, so the, you know, the uh, spartito the, uh, is exactly the same. But you want to be able to understand if what is playing is a violin or a piano or a person. So you have access to a transform that uh, gives you the correct information in terms of frequencies, but if since it comes from a specific transform and a specific signal, you want to be able to collect the information that tells you who is actually speaking. Or you know, so you you know the voice. You want to understand the individual. 
to the sub uh, subharmonic uh, story. Yeah, in some sense, yes. So the voice transform is okay. What if I hear a voice? How how can I get to understand who is speaking? Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank Philip again for, uh, for his talk. We we, we have. I have this since rare opportunity uh, of a, a mini uh, coffee break with one of the speakers. I ask if it's possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> Filippo and I are going to enjoy a coffee break of three minutes. But is there another speaker after the coffee break? Is there yes. another speaker? Okay, so yeah, stop the, the recording, yes.